33 minutes after 12 o'clock and still hanging around 49 degrees here in paradise for the next few minutes of course we're paying tribute to the late billy stewart We've got a very special guest joining me via phone, but in the studio. This man's no stranger when it comes to music or Billy Stewart. Mr. Charles Stafford is on the line. Good afternoon to you. How are you doing, sir? I'm just pleased to be with you today and we'll talk about the fat boy. Absolutely. Of course, you were you were a guitarist with Billy Stewart in his band during the year of 1968 for a few months. And, um, right. of course, the way you got there, you were making your name in a band called The Footnotes. So give us just a little idea of how you went from the footnotes to playing with Billy Stewart. Yeah, I had been in a band in high school, and then I went off to, to college in 62, uh, University of South Carolina. I had an opportunity to play with some black bands in the early 60s, and it was kind of unusual, to, and I was delighted to be able to, to you know, to play the music I had uh, had always liked uh, with some great groups. And I was with a group called the Persians. We had three black singers that uh, went to Benedict College, and as soon as they graduated, we kind of started having organizational problems. But I was loving the music and had an opportunity to go back with some of my bandmates from Sumter, South Carolina, where I'm from. And uh, they had started this band of footnotes. They had merged a couple of bands. And we started booking with Beach Club Attractions, the agency end of, of the Beach Club, Cecil mm-hmm. Corbett and uh, Charlie Corbett's uh, club, everybody knows, uh, which was so great down at the beach. And they used us a lot as backup band for a lot of groups, and we either opened for or actually backed up Jackie Wilson, Jerry Butler, mm-hmm. uh, Percy Sledge, a lot of drifters, coasters, platters, and as a lot of the bands did. And we were playing a week at the Beach Club um, in midsummer of '68, and Billy Stewart and his band were supposed to follow us the, the next week, and we mm-hmm. usually went Monday through Sunday. And we were getting ready. We were finishing up Sunday, and Billy was on his, supposed to be on his way down. And Cecil got a call that there had been an accident and uh, death of a couple of three uh, band members, others hurt. And uh, he said, you know, he's, he doesn't have a band. Can you guys stay over? Because we hmm. already did four or five of his songs. And we said, well, sure, let us make some arrangements. And so that's how we got the gig. And Billy came in. Of course, they were... Uh, all pretty shook up about the accident, mm-hmm. but uh, and he was a little skeptical. Eighteen, nineteen year old white guys that he didn't think probably knew anything about his music. <laughs> but we went started going through some material, and we could see him shaking his head and it nodding. Okay, I think you guys will make it work, and and we did. So we backed him up for the for that week, and uh, he had a trumpet player that was uh, traveling separately, and his drummer Benny Deer who you and I have talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, Benny got out of the car before the car exploded and, and had the uh, unfortunate uh, situation of killing and injuring some other band members. Mm-hmm. And those two guys kind of anchored the band, helped us anchor it, and we did a lot of gigs with Billy um, from that point on. And then I had an opportunity at one of the jobs. They asked me if I would start traveling with him and be his guitarist. And I said, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> so that's how it all came about. <laughs> the thing about it is there were there were three different times uh, when tragedy struck Billy Stewart. Of course, yep. that was the first one in 1968. We've been talking for the past couple of days, just getting a lot of information. You played at the Stallion Club in Durham, and mm-hmm. then you played at the famed Sugar Shack in Boston. But you also got to play at the Apollo Theater, which I'm sure had to be a highlight in your career. Well, you know, I've been doing this. 50 years or, or longer, and, of course, that would have to be the highlight, I think, of anyone's career in, in our genre of the music, you know, uh, short of working in Las Vegas to be able to play at the Apollo, and I was just extremely fortunate and blessed to be able to do that. We went up, and uh, I would drive up. Sometimes I would be here in South Carolina, and we would have a week-long engagement, sometimes at a club, and I drove up, um and we sometimes we stay at Billy's apartment, too. Mm. And we had a week in Albany, New York, at a club, and then we followed that up with, with a week at the Apollo. And uh, it was just uh, so many stories can be told about that week. It was just truly uh, truly an amazing uh, event, and I'm very blessed to have been able to 
take part in something like that. Absolutely. Of course, you know, there, there's a lot of a, a lot of talk, and, and one of the things you shared with me was a lot of times after the shows, Billy Stewart would go to some of these after-hour clubs, and he really had a thing for jazz and would sit in with some of these bands. You know, he did two albums, one called Unbelievable, and the other was uh, Billy Stewart Teaches Old Standards New Tricks. Mm-hmm. And he, mm-hmm. he was starting to try to make the move into some crossover and do some standards and, and jazz-flavored material, and you may be playing a couple of those. Mm-hmm. But sometimes after we would uh, play a, uh, an engagement somewhere, he would say, man, let's find Soul Town, and we would try to find some black clubs, which could either be just regular nightclubs or preferably for him jazz clubs. Mm-hmm. And I went with him two or three occasions in D.C. to these jazz clubs where you'd have different artists, and he would go in and, and sing. I mean, the stuff that most people haven't heard him do, but you can listen to him on his albums. Oh, yeah. And he would just sit in and just nail it, you know, and it was just, that, that's what he really, really enjoyed and really, you could see how talented he was when he would do, you know, the standards Fly Me to the Moon, Moonlight in Vermont, and all this material that uh, from the American Songbook, so... That was one of the things he really enjoyed and and was very good at. Now, before we leave the uh, topic of the Apollo Theater, uh, there was a guy by the name of Luther Vandross Mm -hmm. uh, that would come uh, see Billy Stewart. What was the attraction for him, you know, to to come in and see Billy? What was it that made Billy the person he was as far as the entertainer? Well, I think he was his vocal uh, range and what he could do and his entertainment expertise just having a knack to entertain. And, of course, Vandross was one of the best vocalist that's mm. been in pop music. But apparently from everything we've heard and, and read, uh, he was very much influenced by Billy's vocal ability and, and stretching it out into all sorts of subgenres of, of what he was doing, as well as being a showman that he was. Absolutely. And, of course, that was one of the things I asked you about, just what was it about Billy Stewart, the entertainer? Of course, we talked about you know his tailor-made suits that he came out in, and, uh, of course, you shared a good stories about that, uh, about that whole thing in general. But, you know, it, it came down to, you know, the way he'd twirl his microphone. And, of course, you know, he was just, he was the type of person that would just, when it was showtime, he was on and it was time to go. So what I wanted to do is get you just to, to share with me, uh, if you could put in the words, and I know it's, sometimes it's hard to explain, it just has to be experienced. What was the atmosphere like when, when the band stepped on stage with Billy Stewart? Well, we rehearsed a lot and pretty much knew what was going to happen, but he could change up, and, and so we always had to pay attention, but we knew um, that it was going to be a dynamic show, and if we did a week-long engagement, you know, we would vary the set lists a little bit every mm-hmm. night. Of course, he would always do his hits, but we would also mix in as many standards as he thought he could get away with, mm-hmm. you know, with the audience. But we knew he was going to get on stage, and we'd bring, he would, when we would start, he would start off on keyboards himself, playing a little bit and just sort of incognito. I guess people knew who he was, but he would play a little while, and then he would get up and leave, and then the band would perform, and then we'd bring him on and uh, do his show. But the thing I think that most people that, who saw him remember was the fact that he was almost 400 pounds. <laughs> But how he could move and, and spin around and and uh, work the microphone, and it was a corded mic. He never used a cordless mic, of course, mm-hmm. this was in the 60s. Mm-hmm. But um, would twirl it around, and uh, we may talk about the echo effects in a minute. Mm-hmm. But uh, Yeah, we're heading there. <laughs> we just knew it was going to be a dynamic show, and we were, of course, we were always watching. And I was always waiting for the microphone to come unplugged and slap me in the head, but it never happened. Because so, I was very, very close to him in, in, in proximity. But uh, everybody knew he was going to do a great show, and it was that's when it was all said and done. He would change clothes a couple of times, um, and it was just a uh, you know every every night I saw it was amazing to me, you know. Yeah, and you touched on it just a little bit. Of course, we're going into a live recording of a song that will demonstrate what we're getting ready to talk about. But you brought up in our conversation about him using what they call an echoplex, which was pretty innovative at the time. And, of course, you know, Billy Stewart was very creative. But explain a little bit about the echoplex and how he used it. The echoplex was was a, a... Uh, an, an electronic attachment that you could attach to your sound system and um, 
most everyone's familiar with mm-hmm. Echo, as you can hear. I've always heard some records that seem to have a lot of reverb mm-hmm. or what we call reverb or echo effects on them. But he mastered the uh, the instrument to, to be able to put echo on certain songs, and it would reverberate and echo in with the beat of the, of the song. And then I think when we hear Summertime, we'll be able to really tell that. Um, mm-hmm. It was just that he mastered that um, instrument. Benny Deer, his, his drummer, uh, commented one time that he could have taken the, the instrument apart and put it back together again <laughs> and, and refine it and make it even better. But wow. he just knew how to use it. I've never seen anybody else that, that could use it at, at all like Billy did. And that was That was one of the most unique things about his performance was the echo. Yeah, and of course he used it, uh, you know, for the echo and the uh, delay. As you said, you know, he was just, he was a master at being able to work the timing on that. We're going to hear that uh, in this next song I'm getting ready to play, but um, Charles, I really do appreciate it. Any other thing you want to share before we close this interview out? Um, Well, it was just a privilege for me to be able to work with him. Um, We worked mostly up and down the East Coast from a lot of in the New York area, uh, New York area, all the way down to Virginia and the Carolinas and down to Georgia, and we played auditoriums, nightclubs, mm. um, schools, colleges, and a couple of private events. And uh, he just appealed to every crowd. It was whether it was a black college or a white private college or uh, just one of your review shows at, mm-hmm. at an auditorium. He just transcended uh, the, his his appeal. Transcended the the, the music itself. It's just his showmanship and his voice. It's just a shame that he uh, left us at 32 years of age, yeah. right on the cusp of being uh, a major major artist. But it, for me, it was just a great experience. I always uh, have those memories, and I've got a few pictures and, and souvenirs. If I can make one one request mm-hmm. while we before we get into that song. If anybody out there has any photographs of Billy or any other live recordings uh, or any memorabilia posters, we'd sure like to try to get copies of those because we've got a Facebook page about Billy, and I'm going to try to get back into that and update mm-hmm. it and would like to post some of those things. So Absolutely. They can contact me or give my information out, or they can contact you at the, uh, at the, studio, at the station if anyone has anything like that. Uh, that they may have taken photos of Billy back in the 60s before he died. Absolutely. Well, Charles, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure, you know, getting to know you uh, over the past few days, and um, I do appreciate your time and, and all the great stories. I mean, it's just it's what it's all about, you know, it's the memories, and, of course, we here at the station, you know, it's all about keeping the memories alive um, of all this great music. Have a great afternoon, and I look forward Absolutely. to speaking and, to and you I really soon. appreciate you taking the time to do this tribute to Billy, too, and it's thanks absolutely. for all your work. and. Y'all enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, Charles. We'll talk to you soon. Yes, Yes, sir. That was Charles Stafford. Of course, he played with Billy Stewart. This recording right here is a live recording of Summertime. In this song, you can really hear Billy using the Echoplex uh, for the echo and the delay. So enjoy. Summertime, and I live in the sea. It's a jumping, just none of my darling. I said it right now, and I got this shot. Like a lucky old anniversary, so it's good looking. Yeah, and your mom is good looking. Yeah, summertime, and I live in the sea. It's a jumping, just none of my darling. I said it right now, and I got this shot.
Recording of Summertime by Billy Stewart at eight minutes before one o'clock. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break, and we got two more songs to roll out the hour as we pay tribute to the late Billy Stewart here on 